Well, I want to welcome you all on behalf of the University of Florida IFAS Extension, Polk County. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, just a few introductions, and then we'll allow Carol to share her expert um, tips and advice on growing pineapples. Um, I do want to mention that the University of Florida is an equal opportunity institution. We strive to reach a diverse audience. If you feel as though you've been discriminated against at any of our programs, please feel free to file a complaint with the USDA. You can do so by going to their website, filling out the form. You can call them or write a letter addressed to the USDA, but we do appreciate your participation this evening. Next slide. A little bit about um, Extension, if you're not familiar. So we are a partnership with federal, state, and local government, and we provide research-based information to the public Main campus is located in Gainesville, but there's research centers and researchers throughout the state. Here locally in Polk County, we have our extension office located in Bartow. And as I mentioned, there's faculty, educators all throughout the state. And then locally here in Polk County, we have lots of programming like Master Gardener Volunteers, Gardening and Landscaping, Florida Family Landscaping, Natural Resources, nutrition and healthy lifestyles, small farm assistance, and many other areas. So if you have any questions, we'll have information at the end for you to contact our extension office, or we'll get you in touch with your local county extension office. And with that, we'll pass it to Carol. Good evening to everyone, and thank you for choosing to spend your time with us this evening. We're going to talk about growing the pineapple of my eye tonight. And I'm your host, Carol Leffler. I've been a Master Gardener volunteer since 2005. Um, I am a transplant from Northeastern Ohio. And when I came to Florida, I can well remember driving down the street and not knowing a single plant that I saw. Um, and so the first one of the first things I did, because I've always been an avid gardener, is to go to the extension and sign up to become a master gardener volunteer and to learn about the new landscape. Um, it's also important in Florida to know about the natural um, environs. And so um, I took all of the master naturalist courses, which uh, results in being an advanced master naturalist and also a land steward. So today we're going to talk about growing pineapples in Polk County and Central Florida. The topics that we're going to cover today, first of all, very simply, what is a pineapple? Pineapple commercial production, a history of, of um, where pineapples come from and where they're grown commercially, a look at the pineapple cultivar in our U.S. food markets, home garden growth requirements of pineapples, how to grow a pineapple plant from a crown, propagating plants from suckers, the types, the methods, and the designs, plant growth, flowering, fruiting, and maturation, problems, pest disease, and cold freeze damage, and lastly, the fun part, harvesting, preserving, and enjoying the fruit. Uh, and no job is ever done without doing these the um, activities that finish your season. So first of all, what is a pineapple? A pineapple fruit is a seedless syncarp. That means that it's a single fruit made up of many individual flowers. Pineapples are self incompatible. And as a result of this, they're generally seedless. Unless you have other pineapple varieties growing close to what you have as a cultivar, your pineapples will not have seeds. There are several varieties of market pineapples sold in the US. Most likely the one that you're bringing home from the supermarket is, is called a Del Monte Gold, also called the MD2. And we'll talk about where that name comes from and Tropical Gold. Smooth KN was once the most popular uh, variety grown and is still fine, found occasionally. There are some other common varieties that sometimes you'll find in the supermarket, but for the most part, everything you're going to find is the MD2 or the tropical gold. So a little history. 
Pineapples, Ananas camosus is a member of the bromeliad family. And they're tank, they're what's called a tank plant. And if any of you have ever looked at bromeliads in general, you will see that they have a form such that they have a cup in the middle and the leaves kind of, uh, when it rains, they collect the rain. And that has a lot to do with the method of, of um, nutrition and hydration for the plant and also makes them quite drought, drought tolerant. Pineapples originated in Central and South America and the Caribbean. And so it's, we're basically in this area, although further south is also um, a source. Many people think that the US gets its fresh market pineapples from Hawaii, and that used to be the case, but this is no longer true. Both Dole and Del Monte left Hawaii in 1992, so they've been out of Hawaii production for 30 years and Del Monte in 2008. And you can still find pineapples growing there, but it's, it's solely for the tourist trade. So you can go and visit Hawaii and you can bring home pineapples, but they are not a commercial product anymore. Our market pineapples are now instead from Central and South America, and they're chiefly a cultivar first developed in Hawaii. And that cultivar is the MD2, um, that we talked about. And what does the MD2 mean? It's named after the pineapple company's general manager, Millie Dillard. So um, he spent a lot of time developing this pineapple. And um, just, as, just as a point of information, he's probably not home a lot. So it was something that he did for Millie and it's kind of cool. So um, he developed and released this in the 1980s. And Costa Rica was then and is now the chief place where new pineapple cultivars are developed. Um, the MD2 is uniform in size. It packs well. It is test marketed in the 1990s. And it has things that are very good for transporting the fruits. They have a longer shelf life, so they can travel longer. They have high sugar, low acid, and high vitamin C, so they're very nutritious and, and tasty from the sugar, and revolutionized the export markets for fresh pineapple. So now they had a pineapple that could ship for a long time. They picked them when they're green, but the sugar was already in them, and they could ship these pineapples um, all over the world. Before the MD2, most commercial pie, pineapples were smooth KN, and those were used um, specifically for the canning markets, not for market um, purchases at, for, in fresh stores. The MD2 was bred of 50% smooth KN peck, peck parentage, excuse me. So if you're growing pineapples from a crown that you got at the supermarket, you are most likely growing the MD2 cultivar. And these are some. Um, crown tops. They're just gorgeous um, from 2018 that have been um, prepared and now they're ready to go in the garden. The home garden growth requirements, and there you see two of those boxy style MD2 pineapples. And you can see if you uh, line them up in a box, um, they're, they're uniform in size and you can get so many of them uh, in a box and you know exactly what you're gonna be packing. So your requirements for temperature are that pineapples are best adapted to warm temperatures. They like warm temperatures. Anytime that you have a cold snap, know that the, um, the growth requirement backs off a little bit in response to that and they will not tolerate freezing temperatures. They are tolerant to drought, but again, the growth in the fruit production will be reduced. The size of the fruit will be reduced. And so you do need to water them during extreme dry, dry periods. And again, they're tolerant to drought because they have this tank um, uh, structure of the crown that is storing uh, water and nutrients. They are not tolerant of flooding. They hate to have their feet wet. So they are subject to root rot, 
And a lot of times, um, if you have an area that's going to be wet, you would want to mound up your soil a little bit so that you could provide them some uh, protection from sitting in the water or pick a better spot. Um, they are tolerant to wind, but again, you get some reduction in growth because the plant is gonna be stressed and the fruit stalk may topple over in the wind. Um, they love full sun. The more sun, the better. Um, if they're in the shade, they're gonna reduce their vigor and their size and the size of the fruit. The soil um, can be moderately fertile. It can be sandy loam, uh, which is enriched and neutral to mild, mildly acid. That's a pH of 5.5 to 6.1. So another thing that you wanna know if you're gonna be growing a pineapple is to get a soil test at your local extension service so that you can see what you're starting with as a soil base and what you need to do to amend it. They can grow in sandy and calcareous soil with attention to watering and fertilizer. Um, in fertilizer, um, you want to have a balanced fertilizer, and you've all heard that, which is basically 6% to 10% of NP and K um, with 4 to 6% magnesium. And you want to fertilize with magnesium in the fertilizer mix so that everything is balanced. So there's that boxy style again. It was, I remember that pineapple. Um, you have a lot of folks say, how, how long does it take to grow a pineapple? And I tell them 18 to 24 months and they go, wow, that's a long time to wait for one fruit. Um, but it's worth the wait. And I'm going to show you ways to minimize that wait tonight. Pineapples are in a, that are in a near constant vegetative growth fruit sooner than those that language through other problems being drought, cold, and any, anything that's growth inhibiting. Avoid mechanical damage. So you want to have them in a bed that you're not hitting them with an edger, hitting them with a lawnmower, or so, or so forth. Um, lawn sprinkling systems may result in overwatering. So um, they only need the water necessary for active growth. So to have them on like a lawn sprinkling system may not be a good choice. Um, mulch is necessary to retain moisture and especially to suppress weeds. Anytime you have a lot of weeds growing, they are, they are stealing resources from the fruit that you're trying to grow. You want to stake your fruits if needed. We'll talk about that later. And we recommend that you plant them at least five feet from a structure. They are a visually nice addition to foundation plantings. The advantage, they, they have an advantage in the wintertime because the house can provide warmth and using monitored irrigation assists in dry seasons. So um, the last thing on this slide I wanna talk about is keeping records because a lot of folks will say, well, when is it gonna flower? When is it gonna fruit? When is the raccoon going to come? Um, and, and your records are your most important tool because as you keep your records, especially in the first couple of years, you will learn what the rhythm is of when it blooms, when it fruits, when it matures, and, and when it's time to harvest. So records are very important. So starting a pineapple in year one, um, this is the easiest way to start a pineapple if you've never done so before. So you wanna twist the crown off the fruit, you wanna remove any of the remaining fruit and set it down and let it dry for two to three days. This is so that um, any fruit that is there is dry and won't be spoiling when you put it in a cup of water to grow roots. You don't wanna have anything that's going to spoil. Alternatively, you can take this rooted plant and place it in ground after it's rooted and then water until fully established. It's, it's very important to not set it and forget it. And you can start any time of the year, but be aware 
that if you start in the middle of winter and it's cold through the week of January, February, even March, when you wish that it's not cold anymore, which was not the case this year, um, uh, be careful and watch the weather forecast because it will need to be protected. Or you can just trim the crown, dry it, and place it in the ground. But again, that is the case where you're going to have to watch it most closely. So these are rooted crowns for potting. Um, these, this is, um, I didn't count them, but these, this is a number of the rooted crowns from the, from the class of 2020 in my yard. Uh, there were 76 um, pineapples that were harvested that year. And this is the way that I started new crowns. Um, I, I placed them in standard standing water. I potted them up. And from August, mid-August, because I always harvest around the 4th of August, from mid-August to December, you have a really great holiday gift. They're green, they're pretty, they look like Christmas trees almost. You can decorate them, give them to friends. And you can share your joy of growing pineapples with others. But you need to watch for mosquitoes, of course, um, if you're having standing water. And rooting happens quickly. So it's a pretty fun project to do. So now um, we're preparing for the pineapple plant from suckers. The mother plant, while it's growing, the pineapple is also going to be growing suckers. And large suckers are the fastest way to grow new pineapple plants. You can always start with a pineapple crown but you're only gonna have one pineapple crown until you have suckers. But once you have planted a number of crowns and they grow in fruit, you will have almost exponential supplies of suckers. And especially you will have the kind of suckers that are gonna grow the best fruit in the future for you. So there's four kinds of, of uh, vegetative growth that can be used to propagate pineapples. The first is the crown, and we, we talked about that. Um, the second is what is called a slip. And these are, they have a characteristic curve to the base of the leaves. And they, they're on the stalk right below the fruit. And if you take a hold of one that is mature, it will indeed just come off in your hand. They're not well attached. And then there are what is called the hoppas. They also arise from the stalk below the fruit, and they're similar to slips, but they are well below the base of the fruit and don't have that curve. And the fourth one um, is the most important one, and it's the true sucker. It arises from the leaf axles. It arises down low on the plant. They develop along the bases of the leaves and should be left on the plant after fruit harvest where they will continue to grow large for future planting. I have an example of that. Um, here are two pineapples, two pineapple crowns in the middle of this picture, and two of the large suckers. And this is how large they were when I took them off the plant. They were this large. And with suckers, size is everything. You can see from these pictures that you're gonna get much higher rate of growth and maturation from a large sucker planted, rooted first and then planted, than you are from a crown, but both are gonna produce for you. So um, these two suckers were off of the same mother plant and they were just phenomenal in size. And if you wanna give a really good Christmas present to a dear friend, you give them one of those or two of those. Um, you want to leave the suckers on the plant again to let them grow large. So, um, I mean, it's, um, it's kind of self-fulfilling that when you plant one of these and watch it the next year, depending on whether or not you have a warm winter, um, this, this plant is going to grow faster than anything else that you have in your pineapple bed. So what if you just leave the mother plant in the ground for the next year? Um, this can be described as permaculture, and a lot of folks are interesting, 
interested in permaculture because it's a kind of planting that takes less effort. However, there are some, and in, in, that, in that case, you would leave the suckers on the plant and remove all of the suckers and hoppas but one because you want to concentrate that growth um, energy into that large sucker. And here's one right here. Here's the bottom of it coming from very low down uh, in a leaf axle. And it's all the way up to here. And they're just really large. There's another one back here. There's another one over here. Um, so get to know what you're looking at when you're looking at your plant. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages to this approach, which is called a ratoon crop. And that is not a kind of, of, um, of crop that is particular only to pineapples. Sorghum, uh, rice, and some other crops are grown as ratoon crops because it cuts down on the amount of time the farmer has to interact with the field. So let's take a closer look at this. The pluses and the minuses. This is a great uh, cutaway picture. And if we look at this, this area right here is where the first pineapple was removed. And so you can see that this pineapple had a direct access to nutrients from the mother, from the root of the mother plants. And then here's the first ratoon sucker right here. And here's, and here's the, the pineapple from that one. So this is the second year pineapple. And, and all of these other things are going on too. You know? and, and you normally would not leave all of these things on your plant because they're all competing for nutrients. But this is a great cutaway to understand those. Ratoon crops are usually, are always, I would say, going to produce a smaller fruit because this pineapple is way separate from the roots. It's, it's not got roots in the ground. It is nourished from here from the mother plant. So there's a separation of nutrition going on there. So it's gonna be smaller. Um, the result is less work, but also less plant support for fruit weight, smaller fruit size, and not as very, not as visually attractive. And that's important. Um, that's important to me because I grow them um, in a side in a side yard viewable from the street, and they look gorgeous where I have them. But a ratoon crop would not look gorgeous, um, and they can also topple over. And we've talked about that. Sooner or later, if you leave the ratoon crop. Um, you're going to have a lot of plant material that requires removal. So, so for the size and nutrition and um, quality of the fruit, I remove it every year and start new with a new sucker. So this is an example of um, one of my bed designs. In October and November, everything's been replanted and the suckers are removed and ready for plant. I plant a second row. This is the back row is last year's plants that are gonna fruit the next year. And the, and the front row is this year's suckers that are going to fruit the year after next. So you can see I have a, a design here where every other year, one of the rows is going to fruit and one of the rows is going to be replaced. So you wanna take your old plants replace them with new plants, and then loosen and refresh, refresh the soil with amendments in a one-to-one -one ratio with existing soil. And that's because these large plants, after they fruited, they have depleted a lot of the nutrients in the soil and I always give them a, a little boost for their, next, um, for their next season. So you would want to continue to rotate new plants into the open areas every year. For amendments based on your soil test and soil type, consider enrichments, enrichments of peat moss, composted cow manure, and or compost and topsoil. It depends on what you have what, and what your soil test says you need and um, what the level of nutrients is that your plants need in your landscape. 
So this is this is um, the other bed that I alluded to. This is a landscape that's viewable from the street. Um, I've had a lot of different things in it. It had azaleas in it that I had to trim every year. It had uh, junipers in it, which um, had kind of sketchy uh, growth. And I finally decided that this is a 100% sun area. It, it is a super area for pineapples. And you can see this is the first year. This is the second year. Um, and, the thing, and the plants that fruited on year one have slowly been added, adding the smaller plants into the bed. And as I remove one of these, I will replace it with, with a new sucker or crown. So the first year you establish the plants, the second year the plants are, are near maturity and you note the very small plantings, as I said, so you remove and replace. It's always every other year, remove and replace. So I always can look at a bed and say, this is what I, I need to do for this. The advantages of this site are sun warmth and irrigation when it's needed. And um, we, we don't run these irrigators unless this bed really needs it. Um, another thing is in terms of advantage for the warmth in the winter time, this is, this is heated heated home, of course, and this, this, um, this bed benefits from the warmth of being near the house and also benefits from the um, reflection of the sun off of the white house. So this is, this is a little experiment that I did. These are all the juvenile suckers. And, and I thought, well, I wonder if they will grow if I just, um, uh, pop them in these uh, small germination trays. And so I pulled a lot of them off because I had 76 pineapples with suckers. I mean, we had suckers to play with. So um, the answer is yes, they will grow. And yes, they will produce usable material. Um, however, it's not really practical. Uh, if you wanted to share a lot of offsets, it's a pretty easy way to do it. You just have to remember because they're in small trays to make sure that they're watered. So let's grow up some fruit. This is my third bed. And um, I think I started it in 2017. And you can see that it's mounded up. And um, uh, this bed took a lot of preparation because there was a lot of yellow sedge growing in it. And um, it's worth the effort to fight the sedge because um, you have such a, a, a good growing area that is uh, mounded, as I said so that they have good drainage. Um, pineapples are suggested to be planted 12 to 36 inches apart. Commercial plantings use close spacing from 12 to 18 inches, and they usually run three row swaths in the pineapple field separated by an access area. And that's so that they can, they can reach both sides of whatever's going on to, um, to work with the beds, a lot like thinking of it as um, a raised bed where you want it not to be any larger than you can reach to the middle from the side. So what's the advantage? The close spacing allows plants to support each other. And you can see that these plants are, are inter the, 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 the leaflets are interspersed with each other and they're actually helping to hold each other up. And also under the ground, the roots form kind of a mat and they grow together too. And this is very important um, for a number of reasons. One, they are less susceptible to falling over, blowing over, and they're also uh, forming a denser mat for scavenging animals to just move through all your pineapples when they're starting to be ripe. So they're, they're an animal to turn to. Um, wider spacing can yield larger fruit. So when I make this choice to, to put them about 18 inches apart, I make a trade-off that I will take smaller fruit for the fact that I can, I can um, battle against the other factors that I've mentioned. 
So in-ground plants in uh, generally flower in March in Polk County. And it's it's kind of like the harbinger of spring. You go out and you're, I'm always peering to see who's going to bloom first and counting the beginning blooms, which looks like this. Um, again, flowering depends on plant size and vigor. If the plant isn't big enough, it's not going, it's not going to flower. But generally they come into flower in March. Um, and as we talked about before, pineapple plants from like cultivars are self-incompatible. And so when you're interspersing, you're again, you know, you're doing this every other thing. And so you see these, these flowers. These are individual flowers that open maybe 10, maybe, maybe 10, maybe 20 based on the size of the bud. Um, and happen to, they happen to open at midnight, which seems like a strange time for flowers to open, but they open at one midnight and they close by the next. And there are 50 to 200 separate flowers on this bud. They are what is called a hermaphroditic, a hermaphroditic bisexual flower. It means they have everything they need. They need nothing. They, they pollinate themselves. And so pineapple flowers are self-pollinated. They do not depend on any pollinators to fruit. There be, may be some that incidentally will visit them, but they do not need pollinators in order to um, be fertilized and bear fruit. So this is about two months in May after these little fr fruits have um, flowered and you get these cute little pineapples. I mean, it just, you go out and you say, wow, you know, I got pineapples the first year. Um, this one right here, this is frost damage. And this, this pineapple um, doesn't need any protection yet. Um, it's, it's nowhere near needing to be protected. But around the 4th of July, you're going to begin to actively manage your pineapple beds by visiting them and make, making sure that nothing with nothing with four legs is also visiting them. Because when you least expect it, you'll have visitors checking the pineapples along with you. And it depends on somewhat upon the uh, experience of your visitors. Um, my resident raccoon knows when my crop is gonna be ready now. And uh, he, he uses a, a, a white PVC fence to move down the entire neighborhood shopping from both sides. Uh, so um, he, he's, he's not very much put off by, by um, humans. So we're very uh, aware of him. So again, here's that boxy, boxy shape. And what's happening, we talk about the pineapple toppling over from weight, this one, has an early benefit of having these suckers. Sucker number one, sucker number two, they're holding the plant up. You know, they're really supporting this plant. This plant is very safe from falling over. So it not only has the plants around it that are holding each other up, it has, it has the additional suckers that are holding the individual fruit up. So the bad and the ugly, pineapple problems, and the most important part is the solutions. Uh, we're gonna talk about insects, heat and sun, the opposite, cold and freezes, critters and critter alerts, and protection from cold and cold freeze and critters. And so this is um, my only slide on insect and disease problems because I have never seen any of the above on my pineapple plants. Um, Insect pests include mealybugs, scales, and root feeding grubs. What is the solution? And you're gonna inspect your plants, especially the undersides of the lower leaves for mealybugs and scales. And you can treat the affected areas for control and, and then plant. However, the solution is if you're using your own stock, you know that you have clean stock and you know that you have an enriched um, planting area and 
Hence, I, I've never had any of those uh, insect pests. Um, nematodes, uh, we all know nematodes, root knot and reniform nematodes. They can cause plant decline, stunted development, and reduced fruit protection or production. And the solution is, again, not to have infested material. And, and so when you're planting material, always know that you're planting good, healthy material. If, if you have um, an offset and you see something going on with it, that one is best gone, disposed of and not disposed of in your compost pile where it will um, continue to produce some um, bad ideas. And then you wanna add organic compost because we all know nematodes, um, they, they hate organic material and they will migrate away from it. So the solution is to use good, to use good um, material and to add organics. And lastly, pineapple root rots attack the root system. Use disease-free material, again, the same as the last one, and only plant in well-draining areas. If you plant in an area where their feet are gonna be wet, um, um, you can expect problems. And so you can, you can deal all of these with all of these problems on the upfront um, planting day. Sun scald. Okay, you might walk out and see your pineapple just like that one there and you think, oh my goodness, it's getting ripe. I think I'll pull it and, let, and take it in the kitchen and let it ripen there. Well, you would be overreacting and you would lose this pineapple because this pineapple is leaning over and this is sun scald. This is not ripening. Um, and the timing is the clue. If it's not near the date of the maturity, you should always assume some sun scald. Another clue is that the yellowed area faces the morning or the afternoon sun. So you know that because it's tipped over to the side, it's getting a higher exposure of sun. And it's commonly seen as this one on a fruit that's listing the one side, which is, which is um, the side which is available to the sun. It, it's usually not a serious problem. You don't need to do anything about it. You can stake the plant so it's a little um, more erect. Freeze protection. Um, if you only have one or two pineapples, this is the most elegant response to keeping them warm during the freeze. You know, if you only have a few and, you know, we all have two or three uh, brush bins in Polk County, you want to protect them by putting your brush bin to work and covering them under the bin with a cloth so that you can avoid uh, the leaf tips that touch the side of the bin from getting tip burn. And then of course, remember to remove it during the day. Even if you think the night is going to be another freeze, you need to go out, remove it and recover it in the evening. Larger plants require freeze cloth. You can purchase small or larger lengths and widths based on your need. A good supply will last many years. And I'm going to show you this slide because in 2018, I was still using every extra sheet in my collection on my pineapple plants. And that got old really fast. Uh, you know, you have to wash them, you have to fold them, you have to put them away. And at the end of 2018, I bought um, 100 yards of freeze cloth of, of good weight. And we are still to this day using that supply. So, and this is really, other than the day the, the raccoon comes, this is the worst day of growing pineapples because when it's getting cold outside, this is the last thing. This is not an enjoyable task, but it needs to be done. So this is the aftermath of a cold spell, and it's not pretty. Um, these plants were, were in fact left covered during the night. Um, and I pruned the stems of all the rotting material uh, to keep the rot from progressing. Uh, it occurred, you, can, you can say it improves the appearance. That's, that's a, a selective judgment because they 
surely don't look like nice pineapple plants anymore. However, um, I did severely prune them and they went on to produce not only fruit, this is, this is their final pruning. There's 11 plants there, I think. And, and in May, not only did they every single one fruit, but every single one of them produced new offsets. You can see in this plant that there's one offset, there's number two, and there's number three. So it was a success. Um, two months earlier than that, you'd say, oh, this is a lost cause, but they're very resilient. Also, let's look at, let's look at this. You might think that's two pineapples, but it's not. Um, I get one of these about every season. It's a genetic anomaly, uh, a two-headed pineapple, uh, and they're just kind of fun to watch. So this is uh, the Northeast bed. These, these plants on the left, they look just terrible. They're all in the same bed and they're all covered. And these on at the right angle don't look too bad. Well, the difference is that these plants were not next to the PVC fence. These plants were right next to the PVC fence. You can see it back there. And that gave them some protection from wind and from cold. So even plants that are very, very um, near each other can have very different outcomes. So here's the critter alert page. Um, this is the other bad day of growing a pineapple. Um, you can see this one in June of 2021, uh, a couple of years ago. And this, this guy comes every year. Um, in June of 2021, he thought, oh, I'll take a taste of this one. And it, as you can see, just took one taste because it was nowhere near um, uh, a match for his palate. And he left them alone uh, until nearly August at that point. But when they will, they will come, they will pick a fruit. Um, they just have tastes a lot like humans. They don't want to eat the core either. And if they pick one off, I will set it down by the garden because everybody's got to eat and leave it for them. And they will eat that one instead of picking a new one the next night. If, they re if you remove it, they're going to pick a new one. If you put it down there, they're more likely to eat that one, which is because they're opportunists. So um, another thing is they will steal fruit when they smell it. If you can smell it, it's right. Um, and raccoons, for all of these, we put this grid on one year and he just got up on top of it and reached his little paw down in there and, and pulled off a bite at a time. And we were standing on the other side of the screen. He didn't care. So, um, so to deter this, this Mr. Raccoon this year, I devised, because I had 76 fruits, you know, it wasn't, it was not, um, uh, cost effective to go out and buy cages or anything for them. I used plastic grocery bags. They were double bagged. Um, he had come, he had found them. And this, this bought me um, almost two weeks of time because they have a learning curve. So you can protect your fruit by temporary fencing by wrapping and securing plastic grocery bags. And by the way, the UFI um, article says to use a paper bag. My raccoon would be through that in a minute. Um, I think they've read that article <laughs> anyway, um, but I, I use this and masking tape. And you can use hardware grid cloth, quarter inch, fashioned into fruit cages. Again, they're a little harder to make. They have to be stored. That takes a lot of room. And, and um, mostly if you have a number of pineapples, you wanna use the easiest and most inexpensive short-term solution because this is only a solution you need for a couple of weeks. So because he was sure he wanted them now, we harvested about seven days early. And these are, uh, this is about half, the, half of the tape. Um, about three dozen pineapples there. And, and 
and they were harvested a little early and they finished ripening on the, on the counter. However, and this is what they looked like a number of days later. I mean, it's just, it's just remarkable and gratifying to see your, see your own fruit all lined up. Um, we're gonna go in the kitchen for a minute. Water bath canning. I um, water bath can uh, pineapple tidbits, pine crushed pineapple, chunk pineapple. It's very easy water bath to water bath them. Uh, you get very good at the spiral, um, the eyeing of the pineapple. And the one thing that will strike you um, is that while you're working through slicing these very hard exteriors, that it's really hard on your carving knife and you'll need to stop and resharpen. So we talked about seeds or no seeds. Um, again, they're self-fertile, fertile, but if another variety is planted, they become cross-pollinated and you will get some seeds. So somewhere out there in my garden is uh, a cultivar that it's at least a little bit different, um, but it, it's not a big issue. This is the seed in the pulp. This is how small they are. You don't really need to remove them, but this is what a pineapple seed looks like. Um, other preservation methods. Um, in 2020, we made pineapple, pineapple vinegar. It's basically, there's a USDA re recipe, but it's basically brown sugar and and pineapple rinds. So finishing up the job, you're never done until you complete the last step. Part of that step is your records, of course, and the other is composting all of these um, pineapple rinds. Um, pineapples probably have the highest amount of waste compared to other fruits, but they contain nutrients such as vitamins, phosphorus, very important, zinc and calcium. So you wanna use and recycle every part of very important healthy plants and an important, is an important step in sustaining your, your polk pineapple garden and your polk yard. So this is um, the pineapple uh, remains from 2021. And I, you know, after we put them in, I checked and they were, they were composted in 39 days for the most part. So I wanna, first of all, I wanna thank everybody who um, gave us um, your attendance tonight and, this, and chose to spend your time here. Um, we appreciate that. And this is a list of resources. First and foremost, the article on pineapple growing in the Florida home landscape by Jonathan Crane. Um, then the gardening solutions by UFI about the pineapple. The history of the MD2 pineapple, a very good read. And then um, food preservation information on canning fresh pineapple. And there again, you see our friend and this is, this is where he was at the end of the season. And this is just a reminder that you should be having fun in the garden. And, and every, every crop that you do um, should bring you sat satisfaction that you got a crop, but also um, some fun along the way. We try to do that here. Getting help is easy. You can contact the Master Gardener Volunteer Plant Clinic. They are at the Bartow Extension Building, Monday to Friday from nine to four. And there is the contact information. Also, there is the link for the website. And plant clinic volunteers are standing by um, every weekday to answer your questions. 